As has been predicted, video game adaptations are becoming the new big thing. Hollywood has done this before, though not to any truly expansive degree outside of the Resident Evil franchise. Of course, financially, we have Sonic, Mario, and more, so other big names would eventually be roped in, and what better than another outlet for a possible near future? Fallout is a post-apocalyptic world resulting from nuclear war. Large swaths of deserts, desperation, and just about everything copyright law will allow without infringement on Mad Max. It even comes complete with its own abominations of nature. Prior Prior to the defecation hitting the oscillation, an incredibly powerful company named vault Tech created massive shelters across the United States which could house enough people that each vault has their own micro-societies. Over 200 years later, we catch up in Vault 33 with Lucy, daughter of the vault's overseer Hank, as she prepares to marry a member of Vault 32. The celebration goes well, until it doesn't. When it's revealed, the members of Vault 32 are raiders as they proceed to emulate the Red Wedding. In the chaos, Hank is captured by the raid leader, Moldaver. The survivors are devastated and work to rebuild while Lucy wants her father back. So Lucy decides to brave the wilds of a world she knows nothing about in hopes to rescue her father. Parallel to this, a scientist named Welzig abandons a group known as the Enclave with a mysterious object. This results in a bounty on his head, attracting the attention of individuals and the various factions like the Brotherhood of Steel. All of these stories converge as the characters and organizations cross paths in a series that's been praised more than colored television, where convenience and stupidity are the name of the game. Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right. My knowledge of Fallout is the exact opposite of things like Battletech, Castlevania, and Warcraft. In fact, I know precisely two things about Fallout. Fuck and all. So I will not be going ham on Fallout from that avenue of attack like I did Nocturne. There is much to go over, so where better to start than the characters? Let's begin with the simplest of the big three, Maximus. A young man who survived the devastation of the new California Republic and was taken in by the Brotherhood of Steel. He's bullied constantly and does the dirty jobs, yet aspires to be a knight to defend the weak and gain the recognition he craves. Not a bad basis to work off of. A boy becomes a man in the harshness of the world? Here's how they fuck it up. You can tell Maxi Pads here was written by modern writers because he only fails upwards. His resentment of others sees him happy his friend's foot was lacerated, preventing her from performing her new duties as a squire. After he's brought in for questioning, he confirms this. I, I, I wanted it to happen, is that wrong? Does the Brotherhood find him unfit to be a squire, or even reprimand him as he may be a danger to others? Nope. Maxipads is promoted to squire to serve in her place. During his travels with the Knight Titus, Max is elated, asking questions about the power armor and the mission, until Titus gets bored, wants to shoot stuff, and gets clapped in the power armor by a bear. More on that later. While searching for a stim pack to save Titus, Titus decides this is the perfect time to bitch him out. What the fuck are you doing, man? Can you get me a fucking stim pack instead of just standing there? <coughs> it gotta be the worst fucking squire there is. This is all your fault. You dumb motherfucker, you. <laughs> Max doesn't reiterate the Brotherhood's code, nor convince Titus to get out of the armor so he can continue the mission. He allows Titus to die of his wounds and takes the armor for himself. Afterwards, he plays around with it, seeing what the suit can do, and just so happens to find a person in need. He then intervenes to save the man, who turns out to have been dipping his tender in the chickens. Later, the Brotherhood calls in for a sit rep. Max lies, pretending to be Titus, instead of telling them what he knows and where Wilzig's head is, and that he can retrieve it. Later, Max lies again to Thaddeus and bonds with him, and when he reveals himself, decides to kill Thaddeus instead of admitting to his mistakes and hoping his actions will grant him mercy. When the Brotherhood finally sends reinforcements, he tells Lucy to run with Wilzig's head and presents a different one to the leadership. And despite all the lies and both Thaddeus and Titus missing, he's not executed because his friend begs for his life. And then he's promoted again for the raid on Moldaver's forces where he's believed to have slain Moldaver and promoted a fucking gen! And I don't know what the directors were thinking, but telling the actor to do his best Seth Rogen impression was not a good idea. Here's his angry face, here's his happy face, this is his scared face, and this is his idle face. This is stupid, because he emotes in other episodes. 
Again, this is entirely on the directors, of which there were many, but I can't take this character seriously when in one scene he's giving a fitting performance, and then later he looks like Obama's been hotboxing. Maximus is a waste of a character and a complete moron who only survives because of convenience and coincidence. He fails upwards because the plot wants to keep him around and yet can't decide what to do with him. I really feel bad for the actor because this is such a terrible role. Let's move on to the most frustrating of the big three, Lucy. A young, naive woman with a solid moral foundation. Well, that's good. I'm glad to see more positive values in film as of late, with the real world looking as bleak as that of Fallout. Lucy's moral compass keeps her straight and impacts others over time, in a similar manner to Luffy or Goku. Here's how they fuck this up. Lucy is almost as naive as the members of Heaven's Gate, and at any time she should grow as a character, that development is retarded to make her an idiot again. This happens as late as the next episode, or as quickly as the next scene. Here are some examples. After Lucy escapes the pharmacy, having learned a harsh lesson about the Wasteland's brutality, she gains confidence and assertion, but remains steadfast in her morals to help others, like offering the ghoul serum. Okay, so why not offer it to Martha? You see, Martha was a ghoul who was about to turn feral. And how did she get out of her containment? Ah, yes, you threatened the robot, convincing the two stoners to free even the feral ghouls, which got everyone in the pharmacy killed. Good thing the writers decided not to bring that one back up, because you'd think that a goody two-shoes getting people killed because of her terrible decisions would have ramifications. This is the same problem with trusting Max after the stupidity that was Vault 4. You see, Max tells Lucy he allowed Titus to die and took his suit. You'd think this would raise a few red flags, but just like her uncaring attitude towards Martha and all the death she caused, she's indifferent! Also, that moment of growth is undercut by the fact that she didn't take any supplies. Lucy acts like a budding survivor ready to take on the world, but ignores the pharmacy filled with medication and food? Fuck off. The next episode, she saves Max, who protected her back in Philly, but is willing to leave him to die because she isn't sure if she can trust him. Bitch, are you for real? Dude took a few dozen bullets for you without knowing your name, but now that he's trapped, he ain't worth a swipe left on Tinder? By the way, I mentioned earlier Max survives because of convenience, so let's go over this plot hole. Lucy's Pip-Boy can track the head, which she should be doing after the pharmacy. So why did she come this way? Lucy even mentions the heads in the other direction. Glasses and the whole, whole body. Yes. Hey, I'm looking for his head. That's why I'm here. That's um, I mean, that's why I'm passing through. <laughs> Listen, I have a tracker that'll lead right to that head. I just wanted to entwine the arguments because the writers were just hoping people wouldn't notice. Let's go back to the first episode. After consummating the marriage, she puts two and two together, realizing the dude is a raider. She fights for her life and narrowly survives. When she joins the fray, she's stunned by the massacre and stands there like a deer in the headlights and nearly gets blown away despite having just fought for her life. Seriously, she just stands there watching the chaos unfold. Just like the tone, her fight-or-flight response is bipolar, switching from survivor to cannon fodder at the whims of the writers. Lucy's a mess of inconsistency wrapped in quirkiness and a bubbly personality that gets a free pass in a world that would otherwise chew up any character had their name not been higher on the billing list. This is probably why so many people forgive her decapitating Wilzig so easily, despite the extreme moral and ethical dilemma she should should be debating within herself. Now let's tackle the last of the big three, Cooper, aka The Ghoul. A war vet turned famous cowboy actor prior to the nukes falling, Cooper stood by his beliefs portraying a hero who saved others with no concern of payment until he became the very thing his old self would despise as a bounty hunter who spills blood for money. Here's how they fuck it up. The ghoul is shown to blow people away without a second thought. After he's done blasting everybody in Philly, the place looks like the aftermath of a food fight in Olive Garden. Alright, the standard has been set. He's basically Mad Max Deadshot. So, why doesn't he kill Lucy? She stands in front of him monologuing about doing the right thing and standing up to him, and he just stands there. Shoot her! Oh, but he grows as a character. Not really. He's reminded of an old saying when he watches his old movie, and this is supposed to be the kick in the pants he needs because, again, the man he used to be would have shot the monster he has become. However, this is countered by more terrible writing. 
First off, why would he accept fault for what happened at the drugstore? He has no reason to, and the people that pick him up wouldn't know who they're looking for even if he vaguely described Lucy. Hell, he could have claimed it was the Brotherhood of Steel due to their hatred of ghouls and he stumbled in on the aftermath, but he isn't bright enough to come up with even a simple deflection. Second, he kills two sons because of their work with Moldaver. You'd think the lesson he supposedly relearned about dignity would have seen him turn a new leaf. Nope. The writers want him to keep killing people because that's how they wrote him. Speaking of killing, during the war, many of his friends were killed because of a weakness in the T-45's welding just below the main breastplate. So in the climax, he tests if the T-60 has the same design flaw, and sure enough they do. So why didn't he try this exploit when he fought Maximus? It's almost like he's another idiot written by terrible writers, of which there are many. This is confirmed by who he was before the bombs fell. A famous actor with based views, but when confronted with the revelation of the final episode, he doesn't do anything about it. More on this later. In the meantime, Cooper is entirely carried by Walton Goggins' performance in the same way people enjoy Ella Purnell as Lucy. He exudes charisma, and it's nice to see audiences, no matter their position on Fallout, enjoy the ghoul for this very reason. But the reality is that Cooper is just as inconsistent and dim-witted as any other character in the series. With the big three out of the way, let's get to the most infuriating character and propagandistic mouthpiece, Moldavor. A scientist almost as old as Cooper from before the bombs fell, she leads the remnants of the NCR trying to bring hope and haven to the wastelands. She's portrayed as a selfless fighter who doesn't give up for the greater good and takes in those who suffer. Here's how they insult our intelligence. Hypocrisy is like violence in your movies. If you only let the bad guys use it, the bad guys win. In the first episode, she orders her raiders to slaughter the people of Vault 33. She wants Hank for the codes he has, which are necessary to activate the device Wilzig smuggled out of the Enclave, required to activate her cold fusion generator. Basically, a nuclear power source at room temperature. It is effectively infinite energy, and Moldaver was its developer at her company before vault Tech bought it out. So why need Hank if she invented and developed Cold Fusion in the first place? We learn of this roughly at the same time it's revealed she's a communist. But perhaps this does make her a consistent character, as she led the massacre of Vault 33, and yet is still portrayed as a sympathetic hero. She may even have been involved with Lucy's mother, Rose, who she keeps around as a mostly rotten pet ghoul. What a fucking monster. So much for the love of others, you even allowed for Lucy's death. Though she wasn't killed, you knew Rose's children were in that vault and never batted an eye at the possibility of their deaths. And by the way, how stupid her plan is to capture Hank in person when she's known by everyone. Doesn't this mean Hank should recognize her twice over as she's infamous and since Hank retrieved his kids, he most likely crossed paths with her in the past? Either way, reveal Killing her real name just prior to the wedding should have gave her away. But then again, the writers huff paint for a living. Lee Moldaver, Overseer of 32. Why didn't she send her forces to find Wilzig at a predestined location? If the MacGuffin he carries is so important, why not send forces to ensure safe passage? Even how Moldaver's alive 200 years later isn't explained. She's not a ghoul as she succumbed to her wounds, nor was she affiliated with vault Tech, so cryogenics are out. She's just a mouthpiece with some of the most illogical decisions in the series. Let's move on and go over the lesser characters and how they fucked them up, like Wilzig. An enclave scientist in communication with Moldaver, presumably in the hopes of bringing power back to the people of the Wastes. He's determined enough that he saves and raises a dog for protection and betrays, I assume, to be one of the most powerful factions in the game for his collaboration. Except he obviously isn't all that invested when he loses his foot and decides to give up and drink cyanide! Again, to a previous point, why not meet up with Moldaver's men? somewhere to ensure safe passage when the bounty on your head is so great. This dude with no survival skills is just gonna tough it out on the wastes? 
What did I do to deserve this? How about Hank, the overseer of Vault 33 and loving father of Lucy and Norm? Man, what a shame he never spoke with anyone in Vault 32, despite the apparent lack of communication for two years. That is, until Moldaver pops up and even tells him her name with no repercussions. If she's so famous, why doesn't he know who she is? Again, the writers hope you don't figure that out. And he's from her time period. vault knows about her. They bought out her company and replicated her technology. Shouldn't she be considered a major threat since she's still alive, causing problems for everyone, and was who Rose left Hank for? She stands before him, drops her name, and doesn't do anything? Jesus, give me strength. These retards even fucked up the dog. Good boy here was saved, raised, and trained by Wilzig. He's dedicated to his master and guards him from the dangers of the wasteland. After Wilzig's made to work at IHOP, Best Boy attacks the ghoul, who kills him. But then Cooper brings the dog back to life, so now he's dedicated to him? Even after finding Wilzig's body, the dog doesn't care. He attaches to other people because it's another reference and nothing more. This is the state of writing, folks. They can't even get a dog consistent. Now, sadly, the only character they seem to have gotten somewhat right was actually Thaddeus. He's the most consistent, although still an idiot. And here's how they fuck him up. He's promoted to Squire and helps Maximus, believing him to be Titus. They bond as he expresses his sadness for treating Max the way he did. When Max reveals himself, Thaddeus warns him of what the Brotherhood will do to him should he return. As Max tries to kill Thaddeus, he removes the fusion core and leaves Max behind. All right, I'm on board. But then he shoves the dog in a cooler because he's annoyed. Why? The dog is staying by your side and wants to help, so you abandon him? On top of this, he just gives away the fusion core. Yeah, his foot is healed as he becomes a ghoul. Sure, he wouldn't have known what the dude had to offer, but he blindly trusts the pale-ass dude that's just wandering the desert. And opening right away by offering the fusion core would have given the chicken fucker more reason to give Thaddeus a knockout drug, if not poison, so he could make off with the core. Did he really have nothing else to trade? He's also a terrible shot. Max and Lucy approach him after somehow catching up with the guy, and on the high ground, Thaddeus mag dumps and misses every shot while they stood still. Man, if that wasn't super lucky on both of their ends for not being killed and Thaddeus not encountering something that would have required him to shoot them lest he be dead before reaching the radio tower. All right, enough of the individual for now. Let's tackle the factions and how they fuck them up, starting with the Brotherhood of Stupid, a military organization with religious fervor in their mission to bring order to the wasteland with righteousness through strength. We're shown the Brotherhood Brotherhood takes people in and teaches them their ways. They are strict, suffering no fools, and are ritualistic in promotion as much as their punishments. So why did they promote someone as cowardly as Titus? He's just one guy, so he doesn't represent the whole, but the leadership continues to promote Maximus despite lying to them multiple times. Also, he's at least perceived as a threat to others since he never directly answered if he injured his friend, and now both individuals sent him are gone. Ah, who cares? Keep promoting him. Are they so low on manpower that they can't make an example of him? Apparently not, but they still use him in the raid? How about the remnants of the NCR, which stands for No Clue Retard? Led by Moldaver, their goal is to unify the people of the Wastes and rebuild civilization. So, why did they slaughter so many people in Vault 33? Surely, Moldaver's knowledge of the outside world and Hank's true identity would be reason enough for those in the Vault to start questioning things. She has all the knowledge of Hank, Lucy's mother, Vault Tech, and more. The NCR remnants should be on guard, sure, but not go against their goal and massacre people like psychopaths. With all of these pit boys in hand, you have access to three vaults worth of shelter, food, power, clean water, ammunition, medical supplies, and the people are prime candidates for morality, value, and aid. Nah, fuck it, the writing is absolute shit. Kill the people, don't tell anyone any information, and leave everything behind. Now, how about the people of Vaults 32 and 33? Let's start with 33, an encapsulation of 1950s American values of friendship and morals. 
Minus the incest, of course. The main windows of the living quarters are open to others. I bring this up because people are curious by nature, and living in such close proximity, you might want to peek at whether someone's teaching their cousin how to pull a rabbit out of their hat, or are giving their wife the old Bing Crosby backhand. So, where's the curiosity when anything out of the norm happens? When the raiders from Vault 32 come over, no one questions their scars, tattoos, or mannerisms? We're shown Vault 33 has guards and riot gear, so presumably there have been instances in the past where force was required. So, why were the guards absent during the wedding in case the people of Vault 32 decided to pull a Simon Phoenix? How about why no one else but Norm questions why all the prisoners were poisoned? Oh, here's a good one. Why did no one but Norm inquire about the people of Vault 32? You'd think they would want to check in on their neighbors, but I guess not. Later, when the people are selected to move into Vault 32 and Tubby here wants to stay, the guards block him. The fact that a man's personal decision was denied didn't raise eyebrows? I'm sorry, I thought this was America. Also, this is a logistical question I have. If this is a rationed society, how does anyone's BMI tip the scale past Taylor Swift? We're told there was a famine at one point, and I believe it. There's your culprit. Bro looks like he drank all the water on Namek and led to the extinction of the albino Namekians. Let's switch gears to Vault 32, which is equally perplexing. Vaults 32 and 33 are based on the Rat Utopia experiment, as is evident by the videos that have played on loop the whole time. At some point, the citizens learned of the purpose of the vault and revolted. The overseer was bound and left for dead, while everyone else frantically tried to escape the vault. This is perfect overlap with my issues with the Pip-Boys. Everyone wears one, and they're shown to detect radioactivity, can communicate with others, and even access the vault doors. Why didn't anyone in Vault 32 use them when this incident occurred? People desperately tried prying doors open to no avail. No communications were sent out to Vault 33 for help, and most people just killed themselves. Well, no duh, they were all so stupid they couldn't figure out how to use the Pip-Boy or Overseer's computer to figure out how to leave. On the other side of the coin, the lack of communication from 32's Overseer to either 31 or 33 should have seen this problem taken care of years before the events of the show. Am I to believe neither Bud nor Hank checked in on the status of Vault 32? This lack of comms didn't result in Bud awakening new people to check in on, clean up, and reclaim the vault? At least then, the opening raid would have had a reason to occur. Like, the writers couldn't even get the vaults right. Uh, Albelio, will you talk about the Enclave? There isn't anything to discuss. The Enclave is a launching point for Wilzig's story, and nothing more. We have no hints at the member count, the territorial control, or anything else, really, shy of the level of technology, which must obviously be quite high. No one else really talks about them, though. They're vague on purpose for a future season, and nothing more. Although I can't imagine they're all that big of a threat when their automated turrets couldn't hit a target literally 10 feet away. Moving on, the series wants to be a fun-loving adventure, similar to Dungeons & Dragons with sarcasm and goofiness, but also tries to be super serious with twisted mysteries and dire revelations. Knight Titus sees the bear, and just when you think you're about to see a smackdown like the Predator fighting a grizzly, he runs away, dropping more fucks than Pornhub. Vault 4 was run by crazy scientists who impregnated women for their experiments, who themselves were consumed upon giving birth. Nah, it's okay, this problem was already solved decades ago. Lucy is about to be punished for the troubles she's caused in Vault 4, and in the ceremony, she's bound to an altar, and it looks like she's about to get executed. But nah, they just... they just let her go. She's even given complimentary supplies, and this is the same show that tries to portray the laughable revelation in Episode 8 as serious as a heart attack. It's like the writers consulted Ryan Johnson. Considering how the big reveal was handled in the end, I think most people can agree with what I'll say. Let's break this down. vault is in the business of creating bomb shelters. The Ten-Year War has drained the U.S. government of its resources, and the best possible option remaining is peace. Should the war end, vault will go under. So in order to ensure sales and profit, vault drops the bombs themselves. Don't believe me? Here it is, straight from the horse's mouth. But we're talking about making a significant investment based on a hypothetical. How can you guarantee results? By dropping the bomb ourselves.
This is unironically one of, if not the, most retarded things I've ever heard in my life. Guaranteeing profit by destroying the world. Fuck me, I couldn't avoid politics if I vacationed on the sun. Yep, Fallout's big reveal is capitalism bad. You know what? Let me check something, because I have an itching suspicion. Ah, motherfucker, I knew it! China is so far up the asses of Hollywood and California, no one would dare to question that communist dictatorship. Good lord, even Gavin Newsom cleaned up the streets for Xi Jinping's visit. I don't know why I held out hope for anything more, as their whole act is to say one thing and do another. This leads into the inconsistencies, and that list is longer than your average shopping list. The people of Vault 4 kick out Lu Lucy and Max, but allow them to keep the fusion core? The power armor is shown to be capable of kicking rocks so hard they bring down a building and throw a slab of concrete almost half a mile away. But when used to punch the bear, it reacts like Ash punching Mewtwo. But then one shot from a pistol and it slumps over with embarrassment? How about when Max gets it stuck in floorboards, fighting the ghoul? This is Jax getting stuck in the wall in MK Annihilation crap. Use your Iron Man thrusters, you dumbass and stop walking around like Andre the Giant. Also, how strong are ghouls? Throughout the whole season, Coop is shown to be no stronger than your average man, but when fishing with Lucy as bait, he hoists the gulper and Lucy up with his bare hands. Later, when fighting Obamas, he lassos the armor mid-flight with a hook and winch cable from a hundred feet away. Also, who cleaned up Vault 32? It's only been a few days from the point of discovery to the splitting of the population. It sure as hell wasn't Betty, and Bud's dumbass Roomba can't even figure out how to get past a fallen broom. Who cleaned it? When? How? No time for answers, kids. The writers just hope you haven't started thinking by this point. And many of those examples overlap with the world building. How are ghouls stable? I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume the games are quite different, either due to a stable economy where the serum is available, or the serum just isn't required. If you have knowledge, please let me know. I want to know. Ghouls are shown to need the serum at least once, if not multiple times a day. Otherwise, they begin turning feral. If that be the case, then how is Cooper alive? He's been around since the first bombs fell, so presumably he turned back then, right? Which should also mean his daughter as well? Anyway, who figured out the serum? How was it distributed? My only assumption is that it's extracted from human organs, but who concluded that? How long is the process of ghoulification? Do you turn immediately, or is it a long and arduous process like public school? Why do the people on the surface make no sense? The world is chaotic, and people aren't above harming others for breathing their air, but when Lucy, a vault dweller, is on the surface in clean clothes, donning makeup with a Pip-Boy, and supplies, no one tries to attack her. You'd think people would jump her like Aerith at Don Corneo's for anything that she has, including information. How about each of the factions? If each is known and or feared, why are they so small? Shouldn't their territory overlap with each other's as they vie for resources? The Brotherhood of Steel has a small fleet and a fucking helicarrier, but is shown to be like 20 people. Also, and this is more of a question about Fallout in general, but was America the only country that got nuked worse than Japan, or did the powers that be teach them that lesson again? With how many nukes fell, you'd think Skynet activated. How did anyone survive the fallout? Again, the last question was a general one, but the rest and more hold true as what is presented doesn't make sense. Just like my laundry list of unanswered questions. In no particular order, how did Wilzig communicate with Moldaver in the first place? If Wilzig's injury is so egregious, why not use the stim pack that was on the counter? Why does Bud think trapping Norm in Vault 31 is a win when Norm now has access to the central control console? Why didn't Cooper, upon learning of his wife's treachery, go immediately to the authorities? Did he not think that being an upstanding citizen and famous movie star would have had enough sway to get the government to investigate Vault Tech for threatening to nuke 
the world. For that matter, why didn't Barb turn off her Pip-Boy in the big meeting, knowing it is somehow transferring information to an unknown source? Was she not convinced this could be a serious leak of confidential information? Why didn't Cooper shoot the gulper? Why didn't the gang trying to take the power armor just kill Max? Why did they push him into the armor instead of away from it? Why do the other two raiders leave the fight? If Moldaver is really so concerned with saving people, why did she leave her raiders behind? If Bud is supposed to have so much control over the vaults, why wasn't he in constant communication with Vault 32? Did the raiders not deem the place unsanitary enough to tidy up at least until they got a better grasp of the situation, or were they just that damn lucky to have entered the vault when Lucy's marriage message came up? If Moldaver has all of these pit boys and she hates Vault Tech, then why not raid Vault 31? This brings me to the final point that disconnects most people the lack of consequence. While the main characters certainly get injured, there is no way these characters, as they are portrayed, would believably survive their circumstances. Sure, Lucy is stabbed, but the stim pack is there to save her. Sure, Lucy's finger is cut off, but it's replaced five minutes later. Lucy bites off the ghoul's finger, but he sews it back on the next episode. Thaddeus removes the fusion core, trapping Maximus inside the suit but Lucy walks in his direction to save him, despite having no reason to. Max smashes Thaddeus' foot, and it doesn't result in infection or, you know, death. Instead, he wanders for days on a mutilated foot while carrying Wilzig's head and the power suit's golf club bag. Doesn't matter anyway, because he's turned into a ghoul and they have hyper-regenerative powers. Max has lied multiple times to the Brotherhood and impeded them at each step, but he's never made an example of. The ghoul is allowed to monologue in front of a detachment of the Brotherhood with multiple power suits and no one guns him down immediately as Thaddeus stated they would should they find out that he was now a ghoul. The citizens of Vault 4 allow Lucy and Max to leave with their fusion core even though it is the one thing keeping the lights on and will inevitably lead to their deaths. By the way, and this really bugged me, how did they find and retrieve Max's armor? He needed a winch just to drag it. What did they do, store it in a capsule? I understand why people enjoy Fallout. Some of the jokes are funny, what little imagery of the games I have seen is well represented in the show. Nods to the games abound, even I recognize details that were meant as references without knowledge of them. Recognizable classic tunes all play throughout the whole series, although hiring Raman Jawadi was a waste of potential. And there is a better sense of screenwriting, with multiple setups paying off over time, such as Cooper's old movie quote, or something simple like the Don't Lose Your Head poster in Vault 33. However, when your character's only consistent attributes are inconsistency and stupidity, when your world building has holes like Swiss cheese, the directing is amateurish at best, the writing is abhorrent, the tone can be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and the consequences be damned, well then that should be enough to tell you how much they fucked this up. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.